The difference between seeing what is happening and knowing what is going on is the thought that I have this morning. If you sit down in the middle of a movie or a TV series and say, who's that? Why are they fighting? What's going on? Endless questions because you don't know what the writer or director is trying to say. I wrote that earlier this week. And Friday night, Nicole sat down next to me while I was watching season two of The Rings of Power and said, who's that? What's going on? And I was like, seriously, I already wrote that for the intro to the sermon on Sunday. Uh, So she didn't, well, she knew I was going to tell you that she did that because, yes, yes, just just illustrating my point for me. You've probably been there. Uh, And of course, it's not fun when someone actually does that at the movie theater, uh, and they're trying to get the lowdown on the movie from their neighbor, and you're like, seriously, uh, not now. Well, sometimes, even if you watch the whole thing from beginning to end, you're left wondering, what is going on here? Which is why I picked the three most confusing films of all time, two of which are Christopher Nolan, which is, is his thing. There's three possible explanations for that. Why don't you get it? Number one, it it might just be a poorly made movie or TV show or a poorly written book or whatever. Maybe it doesn't actually make sense. And you're right, it's confusing. Or secondly, the writer or director, Christopher Nolan loves to do this, might have wanted ambiguity because that uncertainty about what's going on is his whole point. Or maybe the third answer is what it is. You just don't know enough to connect with the message. There's something, some divide that is keeping you from understanding what is going on, some piece or pieces of information that would help you. And I think that third one is what often happens in this, our text this morning. Beginning in Genesis 10, it's a long text, but a lot of it is a list of names that we will read through, and I will read every name, and of course butcher the uh, pronunciations, better me than you, right? That's what you're thinking, Uh, that's fine. But it takes a little bit of work to connect to this passage and to the story of the Tower of Babel in chapter 11, and so we're gonna do our best this morning to do that for everyone. Starting in chapter 10, verse 1. This is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. So, for context, if you recall our earlier messages in Genesis, I've mentioned Dr. Walton's thesis that Adam and Eve were not the only humans at the time of the Garden of Eden, but rather they were chosen representatives. That's his thesis. He believes that best explains what the text is trying to do in Genesis. If we combine that idea with the similar understanding uh, that the flood was locally catastrophic, but described as globally catastrophic for theological reasons, then we wouldn't be required to understand this verse to say that everyone on earth is descended from one of these three brothers. So instead of a literal genealogical narrative, what we actually have here is in chapter 10 a symbolic setting for what is to come with Abram in chapter 12. We're going to get to that next week. As I've said before, I think that Walton's thesis and his research and his analysis is very keenly insightful uh, and helps us to understand what Moses intended the text of Genesis to say, which is ultimately what we want. What is Moses trying to say here? But if you are less persuaded or think that he's full of it, that's fine. That's perfectly fine and won't hurt my feelings at all. Long story short, We're about to look at the descendants of Noah's son. So that means they're either the biological descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, or the symbolic and thematic ones. Uh, So let's take a look. It's a long list. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Ripheth, and Togarmah. The sons of Javan, Elisha, 
Tarshish, the Kittites, and the Rodanites. From these, the maritime peoples spread out into their territories by their clans within their nations, each with its own language. Let me let you in on a public speaking uh, tip with this. You can read through the list of names and say, okay, I've got them all. But when you're actually standing up in front of people looking through the list of names, you just pronounce them as your brain says in that moment. Uh, I'm not the, gonna write them all out phonetically in the margin and try to do it that way. Uh, so I might do them differently the next time I read a list of names like this, just because your brain is trying to make sense of it in the moment. At least that's my experience. So this chapter lists 70 sons or tribes or nations, depending on who we're talking about, a number that was chosen to match the 70 descendants of Abraham that will be entering into Egypt at the end of the book of Genesis in Joseph's day. There we will have a list and it will say these were the 70 that went into Egypt. They weren't everyone that went. They were the 70 representatives. These are the 70 representative nations. Why are we talking about them here? Because God's upcoming work in the family of Abraham will have as its final goal, and we'll see that next week, the blessing of the whole world. So here in chapter 10, there is a list of every tribe and every nation that existed in Moses' day. As far as the Israelites knew, at least, of course, this doesn't talk about those living in South America or in Australia or in China because they didn't know about them. To them, these peoples were the whole world. So 70 of them were chosen as a symbolic complete number. This is a number that represents them all. In the ancient Near East, if you list 70, you've listed them all. They, they don't actually care that you list each and every one. That's not their way of thinking. They don't have that modern obsession that we do for this kind of thing. So we begin here in verses 2 through 5 with peoples that are on the fringe of the geography of the Holy Land. When God talks about the ends of the earth, places like Tarshish come to mind if you are an ancient Israelite. And one of the reasons we picked Psalm 72 to read earlier was that in Psalm 22, Solomon says Tarshish when he's talking about the distant peoples. So even in Solomon's day, that was still considered way out there. And so we start with a group of a list of people that are out in the distance. Verse 6, the sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan, the sons of Cush, Seba, Havala, Sabta, Rama, and Sabteca, the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dadan. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That's why it's said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, and Kalna in Shinar. From that land he went to Assyria, where he built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kalah, and Rezin, which is between Nineveh and Kalah, which is the great city. I also find that one of the reasons that people are nervous if they come to a Bible study is they think, he's going to make me read a list like that. Uh, and I don't want to read that list. In case you're wondering, if you come to Bible study and this is the kind of text we are on, you don't have to read it. Uh, I will always volunteer to take it. I'll take the hits. As I've said many times, we don't know how these things were pronounced. They've all been anglicized here. Uh, so nobody's going to be offended. So you might have noticed that the names in two and three were in two groups of seven. If you didn't notice, I'm telling you now. Here in six to 12, we have another group of seven. Plus a brief pause to talk about that mighty warrior named Nimrod, who is connected with Babylon and the cities of the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley. This serves as a glimpse at the peoples who will be the focus of the narrative in chapter 11, verse 1 to 9. We'll get there momentarily. Continuing, it says, Egypt was the father of the Luddites, Am Anamites, Lehabites, Naphtuhites, uh, Pathrosites, Kosluhites, from whom the Philistine came, and Kaphtorites. 
A lot of ites uh, in this group of people. Another group of seven, right? These connected to the Egyptians with whom the Israelites at Mount Sinai were very well acquainted. So this is where they came from. Canaan was the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and of the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, Hivites, Archites, Sinites, Arvadites, Zemorites, and uh, Hamathites. Later, the Canaanite clans scattered in the border of Canaan reached from Sidon toward Gerar as far as Gaza and then toward Sodom, uh, Sodom Gomorrah, Adma, and Zebaim as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans and languages in their territories and nations. This section would have been of particular interest to the Israelites with Moses at Sinai. The tribes and nations of Canaan, we know, have already at that point when they are at Mount Sinai during the Exodus, they have at that point already been judged by God for their wanton wickedness for many generations of wickedness. God had already proclaimed that the land would vomit them out, that they cannot live there anymore. <clears throat> Which is, of course, similar to God's judgment on the people in Noah's day. We were just there a few weeks ago. Or in the upcoming destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. We'll be there in a few weeks. Note that those two cities are mentioned here. That's not an accident. By connecting these Canaanite tribes to Ham's failure in the previous chapter we looked at last week, making them uh, the descendants of Ham, symbolically these are all connected together, as well as what is coming with Sodom and Gomorrah, what Moses is doing here is establishing a thematic pattern of behavior like Ham, like Sodom and Gomorrah, like the Canaanites. He's lumping them all together thematically as the kind of people that would warrant God's judgment because of how they behave. Given that Joshua would be leading the Israelites into battle against the Canaanite tribes real soon, knowing where these people came from in a theological sense was a very useful thing for Joshua and that generation. It offered them moral clarity, and it would awful offer moral clarity for the generations to come with respect to God's decision to remove the Canaanites from that land that he had promised previously to Abraham in Genesis 12. All right, one more section of names. This is the longest one with the most names. Uh, I'm going to have to read it off my paper because I had to make it too small uh, to fit on the screen. Sons were also born to Shem, whose older brother was Japheth. Shem was the ancestor of the sons of Eber, the sons of Shem. Elam, Ashur, Arphax, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram, the sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gether, and Meshech. Arphaxad was the father of Shelah, and Shelah the father of Eber. Two sons were born to Eber. Uh, one was named Peleg, because in his time the earth was divided. His brother was named Joktan. Joktan was the father of Almadad, Sheleph, uh, Hazarmaveth, Jera, Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Ibimail, Ib Sheba, uh, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. All these were sons of Joktan. The region where they lived stretched from Mesha toward Shafar in the eastern hill country. These are the sons of Shem by their clans and languages in their territories and nations. Whew. All right, that was the last list of names. This one includes the genealogy that will be cited in the second half of chapter 11 as Abraham's forebearers. So when we pick up the story next week at the start, we're going to see some of these names again because it's going to backtrack ahead of Abram a few generations and repeat it. Here then, rather than the tribes and nations that surround Israel, as we've seen up to this point, now we are seeing the branches of the family tree from which God will call Abram to make him into his own particular and unique 
nation. These are the clans of Noah's sons, according to their lines of descent within their nations. From these, the nations spread out over the earth after the flood. As ancient humanity did, peoples both spread out to empty lands and congregate together in cities. Both of those ideas reflect the blessing of be fruitful and multiply. As generation follows generation, people in the ancient world connected first and foremost to their family, to their clan, to their tribe. That was what they thought of themselves. Beyond that, they might owe allegiance to a king or some other leader. But the ideas of being a citizen of a nation or a kingdom, those are still far in the future. Those haven't developed yet. For now, familial relationships will be at the forefront of the rest of the story of Genesis. We'll be talking about people whose primary allegiance is to their family and tribe. And you might have said to yourself, why are we talking about this? Why is this in the Bible? What do we take from that? I'm hoping that by trying to say, what was Moses doing with this? Why did the Israelites need to know this? That we would see a glimpse of why it is here. But of course, our understanding is not the same as theirs because we are not surrounded by these peoples. We are not in the wilderness heading into Canaan. Uh, and so the situation has changed. Let's continue with the text in chapter 11. This is a much more well-known story. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. So we're backing it up because we've already talked about the cities that were there in chapter 10. So we've backed the time frame up to the beginning of that movement and those cities. So this is an oft misunderstood episode here in chapter 11. One that will help explain the diversity of peoples and languages that existed in Moses' day, as we just saw with the list of 70 of them. How did they get to be so diverse? How did they get to be so varied? This answers that question. This will, excuse me, note, as divergent as these groups of people were from them, these 70 nations, even those beyond the lands unknown to Moses and his people, even if we spread that out to peoples in distant places that Moses had never heard of, they would have far more in common with each other in terms of culture, ideas, practices, the way they thought, their worldview, to use a big term, they would have far more in common with each other than they would with anyone from the Greco-Roman era that's still well more than a thousand years in the future, let alone with anyone from the modern era. Even though these are different tribes, different peoples with different languages, they have a lot more in common with each other than they do with any of us. They understood each other a lot easier than we understand them or they could possibly understand us. That's just a fact of the distance between us and them in time. Another thought is that languages have lineages just like people. You can trace the ancestry of a language back to earlier, less numerous ancestors. You can group them in families like the Romance languages or the Semitic languages. If you go back far enough, the number of spoken languages shrinks to only a handful of ancestors. Just as the Israelites were helped in knowing how so many tribes existed in their day, so too the diverse number of languages warranted an explanation. How is it that none of us speak the same language? And so we're going to hear a story from the plains of Shinar. That is the uh, Tigris and Euphrates River Valley near modern day, uh, well, not near ancient Babylon, near modern day Baghdad. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. 
throughout this area, archaeologically we know this, many cities uh, will end up having within them a pyramid-like structure known as a ziggurat. Ziggurats were brick buildings filled with rubble. They're not empty on the inside. They don't have interior spaces. They would have a temple next to them devoted to the local god. And atop the ziggurat is a structure designed to be a living space for the god like a palace on top of this big structure. On the, uh, uh, the top is a drawing of what one of these might have looked like. The bottom is actually an excavated one. That is the remains of a ziggurat in modern day uh, Iraq. They were huge, big brick structures. What they wanted was to reach the heavens. Not, and this is where people get this story wrong, not so that they could ascend to heaven, which would be ludicrous. We're mortal, we're human beings. How could we ascend to heaven? We're reaching the heavens so that the gods can descend to us. We're not trying to climb up, we're trying to let them climb down. This text is often misunderstood as reflecting human arrogance. But that's not what's happening here. That's not what Moses' generation would have understood. Everyone in the ancient world wanted to be remembered, to do something that would last, to have your descendants say, remember our ancestor. That everybody thought that way. Because how did they remember things? Oral tradition. Most things were not written down, very few things. Uh, in fact, most languages didn't have a written component at this point. How did you remember the past? You told stories. And how would your story get remembered? It had to be something worth telling. So naturally, they wanted to do something that their great-grandchildren, their great-grandchildren would say, hey, this building, my great-great-grandpa built that. In this case, these people thought that if they established the presence of God, or a God, we don't know what they believed in that respect, but if they could establish a divine presence among them, it would not only be an amazing legacy, but it would unify them as a people. So this is a stairway from heaven, not a stairway to heaven. In Genesis 28, and I don't know how long it'll be till we get to Genesis 28, I don't know if we're gonna go straight through. We'll definitely stop for Christmas uh, and do some other messages. I don't know if I'll keep going all the way uh, till then. But when we get to Genesis 28, Jacob will have a vision of a stairway with angels ascending and descending. That's this exact same concept, only God building it. And we'll get to that thought. Honestly, what they're trying to do here is not a bad idea, given what they know. We are created in God's image. Humanity naturally longs for a connection to the, to the divine. However, their idea is flawed. Just not for the reasons that you might have assumed. Not pride or arrogance. Flawed for another reason. Let's take a look and see why. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. The flaw in the plan was that it was a human plan. Not a divine one. Now, that's the only kind of plan these humans could have come up with, but that was the flaw. The relationship between God and humanity had been poisoned by human sin. And humanity does not have the power to fix it, not then and not now. The solution needed to come from God, and it will in chapter 12, which is why Moses puts this story right in front of chapter 12. We see the human effort, and then we see God's effort right after it. The very next part of Genesis will show us that. So while the Tower of Babel is often viewed as a punishment for pride with this, this language thing, 
It's actually more like God is saying, eh, let me handle this, kid. This is way too big for you. I've got this. It's God who needs to reestablish his presence in relationship with humanity on God's terms and according to God's timetable. Because human effort will not save humanity. God is willing to let humanity be divided, to dilute that human effort further through division and disunity. In other words, God is willing to create a setting where eyes will turn once more to heaven seeking a deliverer rather than to our own handiwork attempting to deliver ourselves. That's actually the story of the Tower of Babel and what it's about. We can't do it on our own, so God says, you need to stop trying. Why don't you spread out and quit this? It won't work. So the Lord scattered them from all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That's why it's called Babel, because there the Lord confused the languages of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. The many languages of humanity are indeed confusing, right? Have you ever tried to learn another language? I've tried several times. I'm not very good at it. It's hard. And by the way, learning English is pretty much the hardest of the hard. Our language makes no sense at all to people that learn it as their second or third language. From the viewpoint of anthropology, it's easy to see how languages developed and diverged from each other over time, away from their common ancestry. Here in Genesis 11, we have a theological explanation as to why that was part of God's will. Why did God allow that? Why, in fact, was that what God wanted to happen? Here we see why. And that answer fits very nicely with our understanding of God's redemptive plan, which culminates in the gospel. God scattered humanity into mutually unintelligible groups to keep our ancestors from falling for the false hope that they could connect with the divine on their own. In other words, the Tower of Babel episode is one example among so many others in Scripture of the triumph of grace over works. We cannot do it on our own. We depend upon God's grace which of course he freely offers to us in Jesus. And this text in Genesis is just telling you that same thing in a different setting. So three things to take from these, this long section of scripture we've worked through this morning. Number one, the 70 nations of Genesis 10 are a preface to God's grace in calling Abram in Genesis 12. That sets the stage for next week's message. Number two, the Tower of Babel was built to invite God to dwell among men, and that is a noble pursuit, but it was on human terms, which means that God instead scattered humanity in keeping with the truth that our salvation comes from God's grace, not human works.